Did you know that Alchemist Accelerator can operate a program for you? Welcome to Innovators Inside, the podcast for people working in corporate and government innovation. Brought to you by Alchemist X, the corporate services division of Alchemist Accelerator. Here you'll follow me, Rachel Chalmers, head of Alchemist X, as I talk to the industry's highest achievers and most compelling thought leaders. These are fly on the wall conversations with leading practitioners in the field. They'll share their lessons learned so that you don't have to go through the painful experiences that they did. So sit back, relax, and get ready to level up. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Noria Tarutani, the executive director of the Japanese External Trade Organization here in San Francisco. In his 15 years of experience in international business and new market strategy, Noria has helped more than 500 Japanese companies to expand their business all over the world and over 100 North American companies to set up offices in Japan. He's also helped more than 300 Fortune 500 companies, value-added resellers, distributors, and original equipment manufacturers find success through strategic partnerships. Noria has deep domain expertise across artificial intelligence, deep learning, fintech, healthcare, manufacturing, and the environment. Noria, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Yeah, thank you for having me, Rachel. I'm so excited to be part of the Alchemist X Innovator podcast and happy to chat with you and share my experience for listeners. It's great to have you. Can you tell us the story of how Jetro came into existence? Yeah, sure. Jetro, the Japan External Trade Organization, is an independent administrative institution that promotes trade and investment between Japan and the rest of the world. We were originally established as a non-profit organization by private sectors in 1952, so our DNA is a kind of private and reorganized under the Japanese government in 1958 to promote Japanese exports abroad. And then JETRO was later reorganized as an independent administrative institution in 2003. Our core focus ever since has shifted toward promoting foreign direct investment into Japan and helping startups and Japanese corporates maximize their global expansion potentials. Now, we focus on the startups and the innovation activities. Uh, we could say we are kind of ecosystem builders for supporting any type of innovation players, whether it be Japanese startups or U.S. startups or corporate or VCs or universities. We are, are you know, happy to help. And that's where you come in. Of all of the many companies you've personally helped, Nori, which do you think had the best outcome? Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, uh, we've seen a lot of our clients going public IPOs in mm -hmm. Japanese stock exchange. And from the viewpoint of track records, uh, those companies may be our best success stories. Uh, however, we are non-profit organizations. And one of mm -hmm. our most important KPI is creating global mindsets by these startups. So in this context, we really want to help Japanese startups getting the first traction abroad, especially in San Francisco and Silicon Valley. So if they get the first traction, they learn how to approach investors or potential companies. I believe the process will be somewhat repeatable. So for example, a Japanese startup named Atonab is one of the best examples for us. So they are a manufacturer of a cloud-connected mass spectrometers intended to mm -hmm. analyze chemical proceed in real time with details. So we helped them to fundraise the first round from U.S. investors through our first acceleration program in 2013. And then they are now global-minded startups that just raised Series D funding and with offices in globally, including Tokyo and Bali and India. Actually, when we met them at the first time, they were really, really product focused. Racha, you understand it's Japanese startups always product focused, right? Yes. And all Japanese startups for our first batch, all companies focus on their technology and their products. They treat their products like a baby, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. They do. And through our acceleration program, and all startups, including Atonap, could shift from having the product focus to having the customer focus. All startups, including Atonap, learned a lot of uh, things from our Silicon Valley mentors or experts or VCs and got connection to you know, all insiders in Silicon Valley and which leads them to success. 
We put a lot of similar success stories like Atonab's case. It's so satisfying to see a company go from that maniacal focus on tech to a much broader understanding of the customer problem. It's it's really an exciting story. Which company taught you the most? I know it's not always the successes. Sometimes it's the frustrating ones that teach you the deepest lessons. Yes, it's not our portfolio startups. However, I think I have learned a lot from the case study of the Japanese first unicorn uh, named Merukari. Have you ever heard of Merukari? Yes. Yep. Okay. For those um, people who know, don't know about Merukari, I just want to explain about Merukari. Merukari is a global e-commerce company founded in 2013. It's like, uh, you know, Japanese eBay, right? They expanded to Bay Area in 2014 and just one year after incorporation in Japan. So it was not a common case for Japanese startups coming to Bay Area at very early stage. Usually they came to U.S. or they came to abroad after getting enough traction in Japan or going public in IPOs in Japan. Because this is a rare case, uh, some key opinion leaders suggested them to focus on Japanese market only. Because since a lot of investment is required for U.S. market, mm-hmm. right? Yep. But the company CEO showed a strong commitment to the U.S. market from the beginning. And they finally became profitable in the U.S. market mm-hmm. this year. I think their success comes from the fact they, you know, CEO or any management have committed to the U.S. market from the very beginning yep. and have got a lot of feedback from U.S. customers. Actually, I've helped a lot of Japanese startups with various stages from, you know, pre-seed or seed or series A to later stage like series C, series E, even the unicorn company, even the IPO companies. Mm-hmm. The most challenging things for the not early stage startup, like for later stage startups coming to U.S., they have to change their business model And they have to go through the entire process from scratch. And they have to shake their head quite a few times, right? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, It might even remind them of their early days and they were figuring out their product market fit in Japan. I think that I see a lot of startups. The problem they are solving is right away. Some, we have a lot of universal problem. So that's not the problem thinking. It's just a case that they are not adjusting product for U.S. market. They have to achieve product market fit. I mean, product U.S. market fit, not product Japanese market fit. That's really insightful. And it's why we teach that customer discovery is an iterative process throughout the life of your company. You have to revisit your basic assumptions and make sure that they're still valid. What are some of the other things that Japanese companies don't know when they come to America? Oh, yes, that's a very good question. Uh, There's a lot of things (laughs) they have to (laughs) learn. Uh, Whichever they are corporate or startups. So we've seen a lot of challenges they face, actually. We could say there are five common reasons Japanese companies fail in U.S., especially in Silicon Valley. So first thing is a failure to find unsolved customer pain. And the other thing is, you know, we, we said, we already say, um, you know, product market untested, right? And also target market too broad and not Silicon Valley business mindset. And the most important things, missing factor is not the right team, team building. So you, you cannot find the customer persona or body proportion without having the right local team in the different market. However, you know, Japanese companies or Japanese startups have limited access to local ecosystem. And this is the reason why we focus on the program that allows Japanese corporate or uh, startups to access US-based mentors or investors. Let me um, say about the example, one of our Japanese startups clients named Bispoke that provide Mm -hmm. AI chatbot service could get access to high-level networks in the U.S. through our program. First off, we introduced a mentor who specializes in customer acquisition for early stage startups. And he is, you know, uh, you based in U.S. and he raised, uh, you know, in Silicon Valley. And he guided them to find the right customer persona to narrow down the target market. AI chatbot, uh, we we be used a lot of, you know, sectors like, uh, you know, education or, you know, government or hotel or, 
you know, airports, but they finally decided to focus on the public transportation sectors. And the mentor introduced a former higher government official, and then they could get the first traction of city metro in the U.S. Now they are partnering with the Star Alliance or Vienna Airport and other international, you know, public sectors, which is a very good success story for us. The success is to find the right mentor and to invite a former higher government official to their team. And they actually hired the local person as a CEO. Very cool. And lest we think that California is the center of the world, which is always a temptation, what is something that surprises North American companies when they move to Japan? Yes, and there are a lot of things as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think the most surprising thing is the unique working culture, unique working culture, right? And em yes. employment system in Japanese companies. Jetro helped a U.S. startup to set up office in Japan, and uh, we helped over probably 1,000 companies, and we helped uh, 10 companies to, uh, to go to Japan. So the latest success story is uh, DoorDash, or, you know, standard cognition to Asana. We helped actually a lot of unicorn companies, including Tesla as well. They are all companies, they said it's uh, quite difficult to hire the country manager or local manager in Japan. And one of my clients used to say, he could not understand why Japanese employees are trying to continue to work for the same company. And actually, he gets a better offer for the company, right? <laughs> actually, my, my client has been offered to the famous lead engineer in automobile parts company with two or three times more than he earned at the time. Three times salary, right? But he declined the offer. And the American company was very shocked to hear the reason. He just wanted to work for the same company. Since he feels loyalty, his company, it's, uh, you know, it's quite difficult to understand for the U.S. people or European people. Also, it's been changing dramatically, especially in the startup ecosystem. Still, two types of culture exist. Japanese traditional working style or Western working style. Traditional Japanese working style on the environmental system will cause a lot of unique cultures of working in a group rather than individually, indirect communication style or a bottom-up bottom system style. I think that understanding the proposal making and decision making process is pretty much important for successful business collaboration with Japanese company. And of course, the Japanese culture has been incredibly influential on Silicon Valley by way of the Toyota production system and its influence on the lean startups. Yep, so yep, yep. startups absolutely see value in, in the bottom-up culture and, and the loyalty to the team. So it's interesting to to contrast that with the experience of the corporates going in. Yes, yes. But uh, I think this is a... You American company and Japanese company have to understand the cultural difference, right? And Jetro's core value is to fill the cultural gap between, you know, Japanese corporate and U.S. corporate. And we also have to help in these as aspects in addition to simple warm induction to potential clients. Very important role. When you look back on your career to date, what are you proudest of? Yes, that's a great question. Um, actually, I'm always thinking at the importance of creating the diversity environment where people can discuss with each other. This will be also a key factor to generate innovation, I believe. And I don't think any one person has the right answer to create a startup ecosystem. We may have the best practice for startup to scale and startup mindset we have to follow, but it's not a cookie cutter model and always changing year by year and depends on the startup business model, stages or bad calls. So I think the most important things for us is cultivate the diversified environment and continue to introduce new programs for startup to access different communities or to get feedback from diversity, diversified environment. In that sense, I've launched a lot of program from the dot-com bubble era, even during the recession period. I've continued to launch new programs and support startups continuously. That would be something I'm proud of. Actually, it was right after the dot-com bu bubble crisis. I was involved in established Japanese incubation center in San Jose, 
and brought over 100 startups to Silicon Valley through that project. After the 2018 crisis again, right? <laughs> uh, Lehman Shock, I came up with the idea that Jetro should introduce the international acceleration program to Japanese yep. startups. In that period, Y Combinator and 500 startups and textiles or uh, alchemists did very well in Bay Area, right? <laughs> yes. But it's very rare case for Japanese startup to be qualified for those accelerators. And in Japan, although there was some acceleration program organized by private accelerator or venture capital or corporates, but they focus on only domestic market, right? So I want to run the internet program to connect Japanese startups to Bay Area's ecosystem. Why don't we launch the international acceleration system uh, to link Japan startup to Silicon Valley ecosystem? Th this is something, you know, I should be proud of. I always introduce a new program to the Japan. And also now we have the COVID-19 crisis and everything is go going online. It's challenging time, but we see numerous opportunities to link Japan startup to premium acceleration program. That is the reason why we recently launched a sector-based program with, you know, Alchemist, you know, for B2B sectors, and also Techstars for Clean Techs, Crime Tech, Barclay Sky Tech for Deep Tech. We are happy to work with those, you know, premier accelerators like you. We are delighted to be working with you too. And I do think it's an underappreciated upside to the recessions that Really, those downtimes when the easy money goes away are where the really great companies get built. When founders have to be very ingenious and very scrappy to keep their companies alive through a recession, that's where we see really durable unicorns being created. Yes, 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 yes. Exactly. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Yeah. If you had one do-over, what might you have done differently? Oh, that's a great question. I think I will do the same things one more time. I think more quickly. When I came to Silicon Valley, I was so surprised. Entrepreneurs fail so fast. And I, re I really like the words uh, fail fast. So I've launched a lot of programs. But if I fail fast, I could launch more projects than I did. So fast failure achieves the desired result after the perfect solutions. I think this is something I and Japanese companies should run from Silicon Valley. How would you distill all of this experience into one or two lessons for our listeners? Uh, well, I've coordinated over 1,000 business meetings between foreign companies and Japanese companies. And I've heard US companies say it's a bit difficult to succeed in Japan or to deal with Japanese company. I think it results from the different working culture. I always thought like traditional Japanese balance style or language barriers or even demanding customers in Japan. Yes, <laughs> yeah. So if you understand the background of cultural difference, it will become easier to do business in Japan. Also, those unique programs have been changed after the pandemic. So many Japanese companies are starting to shift away from traditional business norms. They actually used to pre prefer face-to-face -face meeting. You know, it's all, even if it's only a 15 minutes meeting, 30 minute meeting. So, you know, we have to visit our customers. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, why don't we use a Zoom meeting? But they are actually willing to conduct business online right now and opening up to digital solution that U.S. startups offer or U.S. companies offer. So why don't you do business in Japan? Because it's dramatically changing. This is a strong opportunity for the U.S. companies. It is a really exciting time. You work so hard, Nori. How do you avoid burning out? Oh, burning out? Yeah. Yeah, for me, uh, to avoid burnout, I think I try to allocate my time spending with my family and friends, running in the trail, camping in the national park, hiking the mountains, off the net, internet, or off the mobile. Of the great, a uh, very important surviving barrier, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean that's mm. the flip side of Silicon Valley is we're in one of the most beautiful places in the world. We have the Pacific Ocean, we've got the redwoods, we've got the mountains. We're yes, very, yes. very fortunate. Personally, I like to do something different. So when I was, you know, university students, I played cricket. Actually, you you are originally <laughs> from Australia, right? Yes, that's right. Yes, there were only three hundred players in Japan at that time. Yeah. You know, the reason why I uh, started cricket is uh, you know, cricket's uh, number of players is second largest after soccer. 
So I, yep. I thought it should be uh, something, you know, interesting sports. And I also think, say, you know, it's uh, easier for me to be elected at the national team. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> that's why I uh, studied cricket. I always try to do something different from others or something new. Yeah, this is a solution to avoid burnout. Yeah, that's a good one. What is the best way for our listeners to connect with you or to follow your work? Yes, I think the social media, including LinkedIn, is the best way to contact me for my work. My name is very unique in, in, in Japan. <laughs> There's only one person named Noria Tarutani over the world. So listener can easily find my account. Easy to Google. Yeah, easy to go. <laughs> and also I posted our events, including online seminar or demo day or networking event or investor start matching event or any international story which happened in Japan ecosystem. So uh, please uh, follow my LinkedIn account. And also, you may want to follow my company's uh, social media account, uh, Jetro's account, Twitter, or Facebook, and LinkedIn. What does the future look like for you personally? Are you planning to stay at Jetro long term? Yeah, I feel like, uh, you know, what I want to achieve in my life is create more diverse environment. And I am a strong believer of diversity in any environment such as, you know, startup teams or local ecosystem or corporate workplace or even my company, Jetro. So I will continue to be a bridge between Japan and the rest of the world. And I'm not sure whether I should continue to work for Jetro, but this is something I want to achieve in my life. Yeah, it's a great platform for you. If you could have everything go exactly your way for the next five years, what would the world look like in 2026? What would change? Five years ago is to attract more, you know, U.S. investors to Japanese ecosystem. So I want to try the all famous, you know, venture capital or accelerator or CBC. I want to encourage them to contact the U.S. startup as much as possible. And I think that in the five years, so recently Japanese ecosystem is growing year by year. So I feel like everybody want to be more interested in Japanese ecosystem five years later. That sounds good. Is there anything else I should have asked you? I think uh, that's it. Or anything you want to ask me? <laughs> <laughs> this has been a great conversation. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure. I'm so looking forward to our collaboration, and I hope we can have you on the show again sometime in the future. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate it. This has been Alchemist X Innovators Inside. You can find the transcript of this conversation plus links to whatever books, articles, TV shows and apps we talked about on our blog. And stay connected by following us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook and LinkedIn. If you found the podcast valuable, feel free to share or tell your colleagues. We love hearing from you. Send us your comments, feedback, suggestions for future guests or just say hi by emailing us at innovators at alchemistaccelerator.com. 